Now about today's event um, and Patrick O's um, case. Essentially, as you probably know, Patrick O, he was initially an ophthalmologist. Uh, he became uh, a high-ranking official when he was a secretary uh, for Home Affairs between uh, 2002 and 2007. He then joined a lobbying firm uh, funded by CEFC, which is a Shanghai-based energy company. And just recently, a few months ago, late November 2017, Ho uh, was arrested in New York, and he was charged with violating the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, um, accused of money laundering. So essentially, it's a case where we have a former Hong Kong official being trialed in New York for corrupting African leaders on behalf of a Chinese uh, big uh, company. And of course, if convicted, he faces many years in, uh, in prison. To read through this uh, complicated and fascinating case, we are delighted to welcome veteran New York criminal defense lawyer, Robert Pratt. Um, he has a long career as a public defender um, he was a defense attorney in the 1993 World Trade Center bombing trial in New York, and he actually wrote a famous book called Defending Mohammed um, at the time. He then spent a decade as assistant dean of public service at the University of uh, Michigan Law School, and in um, 2008, uh, Robert Pratt opened the Beijing office of a legal education NGO, and closer to Hong Kong, he later co-founded with uh, the barrister Azan Marois the Hong Kong Public Interest Law Group, which is basically an online discussion forum uh, that get together 300 uh, lawyers, journalists, academics, uh, and activists who are dedicated to promoting human rights and rule of law in the city. And he's also currently the president of Justice Labs, a legal think tank based in New York. So more than qualified to help us through Patrick O's case. And without further ado, please welcome uh, Robert Brett. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florence. Thank you also for uh, to the club for hosting me today. I should say that I am also a member of the Foreign Correspondents Club. That's, uh, so it's, it's a particular pleasure to be able to talk to you. Um, what I'd like to do today in, in a few minutes uh, is really to present to you a hypothesis of what's happening uh, with the Patrick Ho case and, and why I think it's significant. Um, I say hypothesis because uh, many of the things I'm going to speak about are informed speculation. I hope it's informed. I don't have particular evidence. I don't have any close contacts uh, with the lawyers involved. I haven't been party to any of the uh, uh, prosecutors' discussions or things of that sort. But let me start out by uh, suggesting to you uh, a way of framing uh, the Patrick Ho case. And I want to do that uh, by reading to you the headline of an article that was published in a very well-known newspaper yesterday. And the headline of that newspaper article reads as follows. At Davos, the real star may have been China, not Trump. And the article then goes on to describe the enthusiasm of foreign officials uh, from Africa, uh, the Caribbean, Kazakhstan, uh, and other countries, the enthusiasm that these officials are, are expressing for doing business with China. And at the same time, the subtext of the article, it wasn't really a subtext, it was one of the themes of the article, is that the United States under Trump was losing out to China. 
that China had this soft power and that it was using it effectively uh, to uh, attract business in these countries to the detriment of American companies. And what I found striking about this article is that nowhere in the article was the idea of corruption or bribery mentioned. Now, it's my hypothesis, my informed hypothesis, I hope, that although President Xi Jinping has launched a very well-known campaign against internal corruption by Chinese within the country, there is a huge iceberg out there of corruption that's not being addressed by the Chinese government. Namely, this is the corruption of by Chinese companies paying bribes to foreign officials to get lucrative contracts for these Chinese companies. And what's interesting is you might ask, well, why isn't this being addressed? Well, of course, because it's absolutely in China's interest to continue this practice. Because to the extent that China can, uh, through bribes or other means, attract lucrative contracts, this will go to the benefit of China. And I should add, you know this better than I, many of the largest Chinese companies have very close ties to uh, Chinese officials, whether they're state-owned enterprises or uh, people who serve on boards. So these Chinese companies, I submit to you, are on a massive scale bribing foreign officials. Now, how do we know this is happening? Look, I don't have the evidence. I can't present to you uh, uh, a list. But I will tell you that, uh, you know, I came to Hong Kong. I was in New York uh, following this case. I came to Hong Kong a few days ago, and I made it my business to go around Hong Kong speaking to uh, lawyers, academics, and uh, business people. And I asked them, I try to present it as, a, as an open-ended question, uh, to what extent are Chinese companies bribing foreign officials? And the response was unanimous and universal that it's extremely widespread. Um, a lot of it's invisible because it's extremely difficult to actually catch a company or a person doing this red-handed. And that's why this Patrick Ho case is so significant. Another question you might say, well, how do we know that foreign bribery is taking place? Ask yourself, uh, about the compliance programs. In the US and in Europe, uh, China, uh, American companies, European companies have to have very clear, extensive compliance programs to discourage employees from making bribes or otherwise engaging in corruption. Uh, so in your various capacities, uh, I would think as uh, you know, many of you are journalists, is to ask to see the compliance programs of, pri of prominent Chinese companies. So my hypothesis I submit to you is that uh, there is an iceberg of corruption going on that is not being addressed. It's called bribery by Chinese companies, uh, foreign officials. And not only is it unethical, I suppose, in the abstract, but from the American standpoint, and I can only speak from that standpoint. And, and incidentally, I'm not defending the U.S. government. Uh, and I, I welcome uh, hard questions and cynical questions about the U.S. government's motivations in this case. But from the U.S. government and from, I would say, European governments, to the extent that the Chinese companies are engaged in bribing foreign officials, this is an anti-competitive practice. It hurts competition. It hurts business because the American companies, the European companies that don't bribe are losing out on business. At least that's my theory. So why is the Patrick Ho case interesting to me? Well, I, as, as Florence mentioned, you have this rather extraordinary case of, of uh, a former Hong Kong official being prosecuted for bribing African officials on behalf of a Chinese conglomerate, and he's being prosecuted in Manhattan. So 
Uh, from a kind of technical standpoint, it's very interesting to me, for some people it might be very offensive, that American prosecutors are going after people in China, on Hong Kong, who are bribing uh, others in, in foreign lands. How is it possible that this is happening? Uh, that's a separate question. But what is more interesting to me about the Patrick Ho case is that it is a rare window on this problem that very few people are talking about. How many articles have appeared in the media recently in Hong Kong or elsewhere about the prevalence of Chinese companies bribing foreign officials? I haven't seen many articles. Maybe they're, they're out there. But the Patrick Ho case is a window on this practice because Patrick Ho, and I should say, you know, I'm a former criminal defense lawyer, so I don't want to say things that are assuming the guilt of Patrick Ho. Uh, he's entitled to a fair trial. He's entitled to the presumption of innocence. But, so, but let us assume for a moment that the evidence against him is not manufactured. From a professional standpoint, I would say the evidence is absolutely overwhelming that he engaged in prohibited bribery of these uh, African officials. And what's extraordinary to me, uh, if, you, if you happen to look at the criminal complaint, the criminal complaint, which was the basis of Patrick Coe's arrest in New York in November, that was produced uh, in November. And it's actually available online. And what's absolutely amazing about this criminal complaint is how detailed it is. It reads almost like a movie script of conversations. And you have to ask yourself, well, how did the prosecutors get all of this information? Much of the evidence consists of intercepted emails. Emails that Patrick Ho sent to uh, the Chinese company in Shanghai. Emails between Patrick Ho and his co-defendant, uh, a former African official. Emails from Patrick Ho to the various uh, African officials that he uh, made bribery offers to. So this is not even a case that's circumstantial. This is direct evidence. And unlike many uh, cases that are built on wiretaps, you know, intercepted phone conversations or when a person is wired and goes undercover, these are all in print in emails. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, that kind of suggests uh, a, a defense to me. If I were taking the Patrick Ho case to trial, I would, my defense would be, he has to be innocent because no one could be that stupid <laughs> to lay out his guilt so clearly. Incidentally, that's an argument I used in the World Trade Center bombing case, and I lost. Um, but... Um, you can look at the criminal complaint yourself and you can make your own judgments about how detailed the evidence is. But uh, as, a, as a criminal defense lawyer, it's a very rare document that I've ever encountered which tells the story of this corruption so clearly. I mean, basically, Patrick Ho met with African leaders in New York and at the UN uh, and hatched a plan to bribe uh, foreign African leaders uh, in Chad and Uganda uh, in order to get those African leaders to agree to give lucrative contract rights to the, Ch the Shanghai-based company. That's the substance. I won't bore you with all of the uh, details. Uh, but the complaint reads like a script. Um, in fact, I think it could probably be made into a movie right now. Okay, but so what's going to happen to the, why is, you know, I, why is the Patrick Ho case potentially a window on this iceberg or on this widespread practice that uh, very few people have been talking about? And, you know, look, companies, businesses, universities, they don't want to, they, they're, they're very nervous. They don't want to make charges against Chinese companies that those companies are routinely bribing foreign officials. Uh, none of the people I spoke to in Hong Kong in the last several days wants to be publicly identified, right? No one wants to talk about this because, of course, uh, 
uh, there could be repercussions uh, if you start accusing companies of bribery. So why is the Patrick Ho case so significant? Because I think it's extremely likely that it's going to resolve itself by him making various and very serious uh, allegations incriminating uh, Chinese companies, starting with the Shanghai company. Uh, he's going to basically uh, rat on what's going on in China. And why is this going to happen? Again, I may be completely mistaken. Why? Because A, the evidence against him is overwhelming. If he goes to trial, I think it's a virtual certainty that he would be convicted. If he is convicted, he faces up to 20 years. I mean, even if he's not going to get the maximum, given the amount of the bribe, which is around $3 million, uh, he's looking at several years. So the, how is he going to escape prison? There's only one way for him to escape prison. Uh, A, by pleading guilty, but it's not enough to plead guilty. Under the US system, if you plead guilty, yes, you get somewhat of a reduction in your sentence, but it's not dramatic. But if you plead guilty and you incriminate others, you can get a huge reduction in your sentence. He could even get probation. So there is enormous pressure on Patrick Ho to plead guilty. I should also add that, remember, I mentioned there was a co-defendant. The co-defendant, his name is Gato. He's a... Uh, 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 from Africa as well. He was in the complaint, but he is now vanished from the indictment. He's not named in the indictment. That strongly suggests to me that he's cooperating with the federal authorities. He's prepared to give testimony against Patrick Ho. So, uh, again, I may be mistaken, but we have a situation in which there is enormous pressure on Patrick Ho to plead guilty. And then we have to ask ourselves, OK, if he wants to avoid a long prison term, what information might he have that would be valuable to US prosecutors? And from what I've been able to gather, I mean, you, you're, you're in a better position than I. You know Patrick Ho better than I. But he has some very, very important connections. He is an operator. Uh, he has connections to this uh, Chinese conglomerate. There have been newspaper articles in the New York Times and elsewhere about this Chinese conglomerate. This Chinese conglomerate has tentacles in various uh, sections and uh, with officials in China. So if Patrick Ho uh, wants to avoid a prison term, he is going to be required to give information about this Chinese company and the connections of this Chinese company. And you know, look, uh, I've, been, I've had meetings with federal prosecutors when uh, basically they're called Judas sessions when you go in and talk to a prosecutor. Why are they called Judas sessions? Because you're supposed to betray your former colleagues. That's the name of the game. And you know what? Uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, federal prosecutors. I, had many cases against them, but they're very good at sniffing out lies and evasions, right? And so if Patrick Ho pleads guilty, he is going to be required to meet with federal prosecutor for hours and hours, and they're going to go over his story with a fine tooth comb. And everything is going to have to check out. They're going to check it out. And so eventually, um, my prediction is, is that he's going to plead guilty and he is going to provide some very embarrassing information, not only about the Shanghai company, but potentially about other companies in China that are routinely bribing foreign officials. That's my prediction. I, I could be completely mistaken. Um, it's my hypothesis. Um, I'll, I'll also add that um, something about the federal, uh, the FCPA, um, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, this is an extraordinary tool for American prosecutors. Uh, for those who are uh, justifiably skeptical about 
American motives, American power. Um, the FCPA, uh, that's what the act is called in short, I think is a textbook example of the Americanization of international law. Because under this act, it's, it's possible, at least the American prosecutors are claiming, that it is possible to prosecute uh, someone in Hong Kong. Let's say Patrick Ho had never left Hong Kong. Let's say all of what he did was based in Hong Kong. He could have met the people in Hong Kong. He could have had all these negotiations in Hong Kong. But if he sent an email to Africa from Hong Kong, which then went through US servers, email servers, the Americans could claim jurisdiction to prosecute him for bribery. And you know, look, countries can object to that. They can say this is outrageous. You know, who are these Americans? the policemen of the world, and they can do that until they're blue in the face, frankly, because unfortunately the Americans have enormous power. If they indict someone in Beijing or in Hong Kong or anywhere else, um, a, even let's assume there's, there is an extradition treaty, there is an extradition treaty from Hong Kong to the US, so uh, the person would have to be extradited. But even if there is no extradition treaty, for example, in China, Let's say the American prosecutors indicted someone in China for engaging in bribery of foreign officials. Conceivably, even though China refused to extradite this person, the Americans could basically come up with sanctions to prevent this guy or woman from ever traveling abroad. The person couldn't go to Europe. The person couldn't come to Hong Kong because they'd be arrested. So, that's a whole other issue of the scope of the American power uh, to prosecute people that the Americans believe are engaged in bribery and other types of corruption. And look, you may argue that that's an outrageous assertion of extraterritorial jurisdiction, and I would agree with you, but there's nothing much the rest of the world can do about it. That's the way it works, and of course, we all know how dependent the rest of the world is on uh, the US banking system. So there are enormous sanctions. And I've been talking about the criminal sanctions. He's a rare individual. Most of the FCPA actions are civil in nature. These are basically actions of the Security and Exchange Commission. They go after companies. And the, the Americans extract huge fines uh, for, from the companies. The companies never go to trial. They don't want to risk the reputational damage of having their actions uh, talked about during a trial setting. They also know that they're very likely to lose and be facing much larger penalties. Um, so it's possible that uh, the Americans could have gone against the Chinese Shanghai conglomerate, but the reason they went after Patrick Ho is to squeeze him, to squeeze him for information. And you know, if you think about uh, Trump's, uh, the Trump administration attitude towards China, the use of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in this way makes perfect sense, doesn't it, right? Uh, Trump has been railing against uh, unfair trade practices by China whether it's the enforced transfer of intellectual property or dumping or the trade deficit. Um, so using the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is a way for the Trump administration to embarrass China and to put a spotlight. You know, I happen to believe that that kind of corruption is a bad thing, uh, but there is definitely a political angle, you know, I, there, there were stories and, uh, in the papers here in Hong Kong and elsewhere that uh, people said, well, uh, this, this prosecution is politically motivated. Of course it is. I mean, China is not the only country that bribes foreign officials. It happens everywhere, uh, in Europe and in America, uh, but the US prosecutors have focused their attention on China. And the US prosecutors are answerable to President Trump. So those are my uh, general kind of remarks about the case. And I really now 
would be very interested to have your views. Thank you very much. If I may, I'll take the first uh, question. Um, I'm glad you highlighted uh, the incredible situation indeed that this trial is taking place in the US, but I guess to some extent it's almost a different uh, debate. Uh, about your best guess that uh, Patrick Ho will plead guilty, um, surely it's a double-edged option for him because he may save his skin to some extent or a lesser reduction in, in um, the US, but the implication for him coming back to China or his future or his family who is in Hong Kong or whatever may be even worse. So it's not necessarily the best option for him. He may, he may pay the full price in the US and then be loyal to his country. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's what makes this such a fascinating case is the moral dilemma that he's been placed in. I mean, I think it's quite amazing, you know, Patrick Ko uh, was a successful person in Hong Kong, a former official, so why would he engage in this? So I agree entirely with you. That's possible. He might decide to bite the bullet and go to trial. Um, uh, I can't speak, obviously, to what's going on in his mind. My, my remarks today are really more addressed to what I think the strategy of U.S. prosecutors is. I think they're trying to get him to plead guilty. Yes? So, question from the floor now. Uh, over there, Edith, and then the gentleman. Please introduce yourself before you speak. Uh, hi, Rob. Uh, Edith Terry. Hi, Edith. Um, question for you. Uh, two questions. One is very short. Were they able to indict him because of the email, that the email went through a U.S. server? I've been scratching my head. And then secondly, I'm, I'm holding uh, a, a conference book uh, by a conference that he organized six years ago for the China Energy uh, Fund Committee. And some of the guests included Admiral William Fallon, uh, Admiral Bobby Inman, uh, uh, the former uh, Dr. Uh, Carey, uh, Fenton Carey, who's the former head of, of technology policy for the US Department of Energy. Where I'm going with that is, uh, what's the possibility that the uh, arrow could point in different directions on bribery? For your first question, uh, the, the main jurisdiction that allows U.S. prosecutors to prosecute Ho is that he had, he created an NGO in Virginia. Uh, he has an NGO in Hong Kong, an NGO in Virginia. Both of these entities were funded by the Chinese company but he uh, was a listed officer of this NGO in Virginia, which uh, gives the US prosecutors easy jurisdiction. So uh, he's considered a domestic concern under that. So US prosecutors don't have to make the additional argument that he used the emails and therefore the US has jurisdiction, has a much easier argument to make. And in terms of the question about potentially implicating other Notable people, yes, I think that's certainly possible. Um, Benjamin Woodcliffe. Um, you mentioned that uh, Patrick Ho is probably now giving up information on co-conspirators and other situations where bribery is being involved. What do you think the timeline for him giving up that information is and what, in your expectation, would be the timeline to sort of further indictments? Or well, it's interesting. I mean, if, and then this is another reason why I think he's likely to plead guilty, because um, his lawyers have agreed uh, to a very distant, you know, they had their first appearance for the, before the judge. The parties had their first appearance before the judge earlier this month. Um, and if a defendant were planning to go to trial, the defendant would insist on what's called a speedy trial. And under the U.S. law, a defendant has the right to a trial, usually within 70 days. And a, a defendant who wants to go to trial usually insists on a speedy trial because the defendant knows very well the longer he or she gives the U.S. government time to prepare its case, the stronger the case is going to be. So you want to have a speedy trial. His lawyers have agreed to a trial date of January 2019. So that suggests to me that there are going to be plea negotiations. Now, the, gov the lawyers involved, they're former federal prosecutors. I mean, uh, Patrick Ho's lawyers are former federal prosecutors. Are, um, 
are, have said, well, we need time to go over all these documents and things like that. I think that's a cover argument. I don't believe it. I think they're going to be using this time to basically work out a plea agreement uh, and to give the time to U.S. prosecutors to thoroughly debrief him. So, I mean, in terms of a guilty plea, if that's in the offing, I think that could happen any day. Uh, or it could be much later. He might want to uh, uh, not plead guilty so he has some leverage. But I think most of this time, most of this year, will be engaged in very intensive plea uh, negotiations and debriefing by federal prosecutors. Thank you. Ed, Mike. Please also identify who you, you are yeah, with. Uh, Ed Chin, I'm with the uh, Press Freedom Committee at FCC. Now, I, I go to uh, the prison ministry in, in Hong Kong, but of course it's a different setting. So how is a typical day like at the New York Detention Center? We have seen on pictures that Patrick Ho uh, lost a lot of weight. So uh, from your knowledge, how, how is it like to spend a day there? Well, I, I, fortunately, I haven't spent a whole day there. I've, I've visited my clients. It's dismal. Completely dismal. I mean, basically, he is being held uh, at uh, a high-rise uh, prison facility right next to the federal courthouse in Manhattan. Um, there's very little opportunity for him to exercise or go outside. There's, uh, it's it's uh, oppressive. Uh, I mean, I don't think he's being physically abused, but he's being held there with uh, accused terrorists, um, counterfeiters, uh, violent felons. Uh, this is by no means, the, you know, the, the, the term for an easy prison is, is called uh, um, club fed. Uh, this is not club fed. It's, it's, it's dismal, discouraging, and he's under constant uh, surveillance. It's dehumanizing. That's all I can say. And Peter, to follow on from that, I mean, if, they, if this is going to be an extended trial, what are the chances are that he's going to survive that length of time? And will they need to get the information out of him before anything might happen to him if he's in these conditions and he's not generally being looked upon as a particularly robust uh, health-wise person? Yes, that's always a possibility. You know, the other interesting wrinkle to this case is he's not been granted bail. That's a, that's a bit of a mystery. Um, his co-defendant, remember, the one whose name has vanished from the indictment, he's on bail, but Patrick Ho is not on bail. Um, so I don't know whether he's been unable to convince uh, federal prosecutors to, uh, that, that he's not a flight risk, um, but it's curious to me. And, uh, but it's also possible that his lawyers have agreed uh, to keep him in prison for his own safety. Maybe the prosecutors think that if he is out on bail, uh, various parties might try to uh, harm him or uh, discourage him from talking to the authorities. That's, that's pure speculation. More questions from the floor? Over there, yes, at the back. Thank you. I'm Robin K Taylor I'm, uh, with Auto Trading. Uh, my question to you is, with this kind of cases, it's a huge embarrassment to the Chinese government. It's also hugely risky for the, for the large as Chinese conglomerate. Do you have any expectation that the Chinese government may change the rules to prevent this kind of a behavior in the future? And uh, if you do, if you can comment on any kind of time frame or you have very little expectation something may happen soon. I think that's an interesting question. I, my, speaking optimistically, I mean, I think that's the grand strategy, um, is that if, if, I, if, if my hypothesis is correct and the Patrick Ho case will uh, shed a light on what has been a widespread but unspoken practice of Chinese companies, uh, the Chinese are going to be embarrassed and uh, they will do something to discourage Chinese companies from engaging in this conduct. And I think that one of the first things would be is that uh, the companies will have to develop detailed compliance programs to show that their employees are, are not doing this and to show federal prosecutors, U.S. prosecutors, uh, 
that these companies are serious about ending this practice. Otherwise, the companies themselves are going to be liable. I think it, this case is a warning shot because if, this, if these allegations continue, then what happens is that the SEC or federal prosecutors uh, makes a complaint against a Chinese company. And even if the evidence of the corruption is weak, it's likely that if, if the company fights those allegations and loses, it's facing millions and millions of dollars in fines at the very least. So I think there's a big incentive for the Chinese authorities to stop this practice. Next question. Yes, the gentleman here. Thanks, uh, Alan Schiffman. I'm a retired partner from, uh, from Skadden. Um, um, Rob, you alluded to, uh, to this case being consistent with um, uh, Trump's rhetoric on, uh, on China's unfair trade practices. But cases like this seem to me often take, often take like a, at least a year, if not more, of investigations by federal prosecutors to, you know, they, they might hear about it two years ago, they start digging into it, they start accumulating yes. the information. Mm -hmm. So basically what I'm saying is this, there's a very good likelihood that this, this kind of investigation would have been started under Obama's administration. Oh, I think it was, So, yes. So do you really see any, any difference in the U.S.'s political climate for how, how and whether a case like this would be prosecuted to its end? I think that's a good question. I do think that um, uh, although the, the investigation was started in, at least in 2014, at the, uh, around that time, uh, the investigation could have gone several ways at that point. I mean, given what the investigators found about these discussions, the investigators could have, for example, made a complaint against the Chinese company. It didn't have to indict Patrick Ho. Um, so, uh, I mean, uh, I think President Obama was on record at various stages um, uh, complaining about uh, Chinese trade practices, but I think the Trump, Trump administration upped the ante uh, by uh, authorizing this person's indictment uh, and bringing him to trial. Uh, but again, that's speculation. I, and, you know, I may be wrong that somehow uh, Trump has seized upon this uh, as, a, as a weapon, but Trump, remember, w was on the record several years ago about complaining about the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. He said publicly, you know, this is a ridiculous thing. It's making the U.S. into uh, the policeman of the world. It hurts us. Uh, but under his administration, he's authorized this prosecution. So uh, either he's changed his mind or people have convinced him that this is an opportunity to put extra pressure on China. Yes, here. Uh, John Davison, I'm a local lawyer. Um, I ask you as a lawyer, does the does UK and the the UK and the European governments have similar legislation, therefore have similar jurisdictions to uh, impose uh, to, to charge people in this way? Yes, uh, I actually asked that of a UK lawyer. Um, yes, the UK has the Bribery Act, but uh, what, I, what the lawyer told me is uh, they just don't have the funds to do this kind of investigation. The US government has the money. And if you look at the complaint, it looks, it's an enormously complex investigation. So yes, there are laws on the books in other jurisdictions against uh, companies that make uh, bribes to foreign officials, but the U.S. prosecutors have the, apparently have the resources to make it happen. Question here. Um, a couple of comments. Sorry, my name is Steve Tennant. A couple of comments and a question. Um, if you want to find out more allegations, and I use the word allegations, about... Uh, Chinese construction companies being involved in corrupt practices. I draw your attention to the World Bank. They're finding their funding of development aid projects. They've got a long list of Chinese contractors who are forbidden to participate. The Bangladesh government last week expelled uh, a very major Chinese contractor. I won't name them, 
I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but yes. they expelled them. Mm -hmm. So there are certainly uh, allegations. I come from the infrastructure development business myself. So uh, as a non-American, I'm just slightly curious to know a little bit more about the jurisdiction of the US Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. I would say in respect of the British Corruption Act, one of the very first uh, uses of it outside of Britain was involving the procurement of a very large construction project in the Middle East, which involved British companies, and the company concerned went under mm -hmm, yes. after they were fined. Well, the jurisdictional elements are very complex. Um, basically, if uh, you're a U.S. company, obviously, uh, you can be prosecuted. But there's this other category called if you're a US, if you're a domestic concern. So you can be a foreign official, a foreign uh, company, uh, but if you have offices in the U.S., uh, you are there is jurisdiction. And then there's something called territorial jurisdiction, and that's, the, that's the, probably the most controversial clause of jurisdiction. And that simply means that if you are, are, are in the U.S. or if you, you, if you use the U.S. Uh, mails in any way, the U.S. has jurisdiction. And it, as, as we all know, it's very hard to contract or do anything through the internet or to uh, wire money uh, to without touching U.S. territory. Uh, interestingly enough, that and that's the, the the technical term is there has to be some nexus between the corrupt act and the U.S. But the nexus under the U.S. federal prosecutors can be very very slight, uh, and it could just simply be an email that passes through a U.S. server. Now, what's interesting, though, is that that kind of jurisdiction, that third category, has never been tested in court. Uh, the reason is that companies don't want to lose. They're much more eager to settle and get the whole thing dismissed than to actually go to court and have to make the legal arguments that would be necessary to test this extraterritorial jurisdiction but it's extremely broad. More question? Otherwise I have one. Okay, there, thank you. Yeah, thank you, my, my name's Russ Harding. I was just um, interested because in this particular case, they're prosecuting an individual, but you've also mentioned companies. Now, when, when they're using FATCA, can you give us some idea of the way that the, uh, the, the prosecutors decide whether or not they're going to go after the company, whether they're going to go after an individual? And could they, for instance, if they were going after the company, could they go for uh, a specific post in the company, like the, the, the CEO or the chairman or compliance officer or, or something along those lines? How do they decide and how do they go with this? I mean, I guess, obviously, there's good evidence against Patrick Ho, so, right. but in general. Well, you know, I, 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 it would be speculation, obviously, on my part. I do, my sense is, is that uh, the U.S., uh, the, the view has changed that if the U.S., simply fines or even uh, launches a criminal action against companies, no one ever goes to jail. Uh, it's when, when the U.S. targets a company, it's not particular people in the company. It's the company itself as a legal entity, as a legal person. Um, and so uh, in terms of individual responsibility, no one in that company will ever suffer uh, a jail term or even be fined individually. Now, the company may go under uh, because it cannot pay the fine, but most times prosecutors will say, look, uh, we're not going to go after the maximum fine, but you have to pay us X, Y, and Z, and we won't do that. It's a kind of extortion, right? But I think the trend has been that uh, it's too easy for companies to absorb those losses, um, and no one really suffers. Maybe the stockholders do. And that's why I think uh, we're going to see uh, increasing numbers of people indicted and brought to trial because there they are going to suffer dire consequences and they might also give up information that will allow federal regulators to go after the companies 
Thanks. So I'll take the last question, if I may. Uh, do you know about the reactions in China through official and non-official channels to this case? And what does it say about uh, Chinese um, yeah, attitude towards this case? I'm, I'm afraid not. I don't know. I haven't been able to follow the press. Maybe others have. have I've maybe asked that question of the audience, whether there has been reaction in China. Has it been silenced? Has it, uh, so, but anyway, so you haven't heard of no, any heard comments, of neither official right. nor in the press, because the press could have judged that it was inappropriate right. or something like that. We don't know that yet. I haven't heard that yet. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, actually, it's 2 o'clock, so we'll, uh, we'll finish uh, now. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pratt, for this very uh, interesting uh, talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.